So the right. pressure's off, but pressure's never <laughs> off, mate. Pressure's never off. I love the pressure. I love the pressure. <laughs> Lives in the cooker. Uh, so I'll press go live on YouTube and got a few comments already there, which is good, which is nice. Hope everyone's mm-hmm. going well. And we're live, Tim, mate. So whenever you want to get the ball rolling, mate, I'm I'm all go good to go. All right, let's do this shit. Hello and welcome everyone to the first AFL Fantasy Fanatics episode for season 2024. We are recording live on Twitter. We would normally be re- oh, are we on YouTube or we're just not at all? We got no hang on, we're gonna start all that shit again. So yeah. we're not no, we're, we're not just audio or nothing at all. Uh, no, so we're streaming on which audios on YouTube tonight. And yeah, then, okay, um, okay, sure, sure. Yeah, that's what I wasn't sure about whether we were or not. I'll do yeah. the whole thing again. Yeah. All good. Hello and welcome everyone to the first AFL Fantasy Fanatics episode for season 2024. We are recording live on Twitter and YouTube on Sunday the 11th of February and we are almost 32 days to the minute when the AFL Fantasy season begins. I'm your host and AFL Fantasy Fanatic, Tim Guest, and you can find me on Twitter at TimGuestAU and if there's a player you want discussed or a question you want answered, in particular rookies, because we got the rookie expert here tonight, make sure you want to tweet us on the spaces or comment. If you're watching on YouTube, we'll make sure we get through to all of those. Before we finish now, of course, joining me as always is my co-host, the man who's been smashing out those head-to-head videos with other fantasy community legends, Bales, mate. How are you? Talk to me about the head-to-heads. Talk to me about the coaches from the community. How's it all been going? Yeah, good, Tim. Uh, it's obviously, as you said, been a while since we've recorded the Twitter space. It's, uh, it was essentially just what, every Friday, Sunday for me last year was just Twitter space. About a few months off, but good to be back. And, uh, yeah, head-to-head videos have been, been going quite well. Obviously had a heap of legends um, throughout the community have jumped on um, and gone through sort of two plays. If people haven't checked out the series, which – if you haven't, make sure you, you go and check out the first 12 episodes. Episode 13 drops tomorrow with, funny enough, my other fancy fanatic, uh, Tim. Uh, tomorrow talking about a couple of uh, premium midfielders. But, yeah, make sure you check it out. Had some great guests on and really good debate. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately uh, MJ is uh, – and um, uh, Mitch have said it's a Bowles curse because two of the players from the series have been injured and he's Chapman and Payne oh. So, mate, so – so anyone's got Tom Green or Errol Gordon in the side, maybe you've got to watch out for this uh, potential curse. But uh, it's been going well, mate. And, uh, yeah, ready to get stuck into some uh, AFL Fantasy um, uh, chat with a rookie expert and with only uh, 32 days away from the season. Exactly. Well, that's turning our attention to the man himself, the man we've got on. We are always privileged to have legends from the community and, and really, you know, expert guests. And, of course, we've got the rookie expert from DT Talk. We've got Sports by Fry. Fry, mate, how are you? I'm well, gentlemen. Thank you for having me, as always. Uh, it's great to be back on the Twitter spaces uh, to kickstart season 2024. Only a month now. We're going to get some footy action pretty soon. So, yeah, things are starting to feel real. Chomping at the bit, mate, for the practice games? Yeah, quite. I think uh, I'm not a super diehard go to the intra-club games, but I might try and sneak to a couple of the uh, practice matches between actual AFL sides. Um, I'm pretty sure Port Adelaide or Adelaide are coming over here to clash with one of the WA squads. So. Be rude not to go and uh, have a sticky bed. And of course, that's what we want to really focus on today as well, like because that's when it starts to get really real for the rookies in terms of we start to see who are really performing, who's getting the roles in the practice matches. But of course, we wanted to have today's episode because the important thing is you got to know who to have your eyes on, who to be watching, who to be paying attention to. You know, and it also really, it's, I find it really important at this time of the season as well to get an idea about who those rookies might be, so you can start setting the structure for your team for the year. So. Perfect for us to touch base with you today, Fry. Mate, um, part, before we get stuck into the rookies, how's, how's your pre-season going, mate? Yeah, strong. I've, uh, like you said, Tim, I'm dropping and changing a, quite a bit. Uh, I did give myself about a month off from when the season launched. I'm usually an overthinker and spent way too long tinkering and looking at my team, but this year I kind of had a slow start, but I'm starting to ramp up now. And I think, like you said, depending on, which rookies we think we can trust across different lines will really dictate a lot of your structure. How many premiums can you afford in certain areas? Um, so, yeah, just starting to have a bit of a play and a tinker and build out the final squad. But uh, optimistic that this will be the year that I can uh, get my hands on a hat or a shiny new car. Oh, me too, mate. Yeah, we'll <laughs> yes, share we'll... it, Bales. We'll, take, we'll uh, <laughs> co-own it. 
as yeah. is the case for the start of the season, we're all hopeful coaches, right? Until about round six or seven, until most of us, you know, have our head in our hands and, you know, it's like it's already over. I'll be oh, we'll, we'll, if we'll... I get to our round six or seven, <laughs> about three games into the season, and I start to give up. Oh, Tim, uh, we'll obviously chat about it after once we chat about rookies and question that. But, mate, I think you've got a certain goal that you want to do over probably winning a car, which is a certain other podcast that beat him at a certain competition. But we'll touch on that a little bit later. Oh, as well. nothing, nothing wrong with a little bit of healthy competition, though. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of healthy competition. <laughs> Let's stir the pot a little bit, get things going. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it, mate. All right, mate. All right. Well, look, let's turn it over to the man himself. Fry, how do you want to do this? I reckon we just kind of run through lines if you want, boys, because I think, you know, I can talk about some of the relevant names. Most of the coaches listening to this, I'm sure, are aware of who the guys are, but there might be a couple of diamonds in the rough that people haven't heard of as well. So I reckon, yeah, we're just starting defence and go through there. It's key off, mate. Well, the big one, I think, would uh, would dictate a lot for coaches is whether you want to put Daniel Curtin at your D6 spot or not, like tall, versatile talent there was uh, a lot of buzz that he was going to go to the eagles obviously adelaide picked him up on the draft and he's had some niggles throughout the preseason doesn't seem like anything serious but seems like he's going to slot into their defense so if he's sitting you know at your d6 right now you're hoping that he can churn out a couple of 50 and 60 scores doesn't have that early buy obviously which is very convenient and i think he'll be someone that a lot of coaches will pick on field but being a taller intercept defender, you do wonder how he's going to score. Maybe he'll churn out 40s or 50s. I don't think he's going to get the midfield clock that um, some coaches are optimistic that he'll get to pump up his scores. But he's obviously the most popular backman at the moment. And I assume sitting in both of your uh, starting sides as well. Yeah, yeah mate. he's sitting in mine, but he's at D7 for me. And, and look, I think the thing that coaches have got to watch there, is, as you probably tell us, mate, is that... Um, you know, when you're looking at his uh, junior numbers, he played a lot of that midfield time, but that was the kind of role that he would have had in that team, and that's probably not the role that he's going to be playing at Adelaide. He's going to be playing more of that taller, more accountable defender, which, of course, you know, it's a bit worrying about the scores. And he's priced pretty highly as well at 279. So, yeah, he's – I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure if I'm confident enough to have him on field. Of course, it's going to depend how the season, you know, shapes up. But um, – uh, and then I'm even I'm even looking for other options because at 279, if his scoring's not there, um, you know he might. Um, yeah, I mean he's got the job security right, but but the scoring's a question. Yeah, you'd think so. It is a bit to pay up, obviously, for a bloke that you have on your bench. I'm always a bit of a like I back in these high draft picks. I think that you know that seven it says what do you say 279 that extra near 80. grand could be the difference between getting a player you want in your midfield or settling for someone else but these high draft picks they usually get a pretty good run through the, at least the first half of the season and I think Dan Curtin will get that um, you were talking about his numbers Tim when he was playing with WA in the under 18 champs he was predominantly a midfielder I wouldn't say pure mid but averaged his 100 plus and then when he was playing league with Claremont this year he was just a fraction under 60 points so I think yeah okay 50-odd points is probably what we're going to get week in, week out. And then if he is sitting on your bench, you know, maybe coaches who are looking at starting with someone like a Nick Dacos, uh, he will probably be your cover when he goes Zach out. Zach Williams, yeah. Around, yeah. Yeah, Zach Williams, Kitty Coleman, someone that I've been big on this preseason as well. So it's tricky. There's not a lot of uh, names jumping off the page value-wise. I do think that Marty Hoare at 307K, if he's in um, Melbourne's starting side, he'll become a very popular pick. Showed that he can score previously. He was a bit unlucky to get delisted when all the COVID list changes came through, but he's another one that I'm pretty keen on. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, just so the Crows fan can actually get in and say something about Dan Curtin boys. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, no, I, yeah, I, it's, I think for him it's going to be a, a role dependent on on game and, and how that's going. Because I, I think the Crows are going to start two key defenders with Mark Keane and and, uh, well, Bucks is obviously injured at the moment, whether that's uh, Bore Lace or someone there. So I think they're going to have two key sets. I think he's going to have that, yeah, that third tall um, uh, sort of role and allow Mitch Hinge to become a bit more loose around the ground, where that makes Mitch Hinge an, an option. Uh, is mm. Obviously, we'll, we're sure we'll chat about him at some point throughout the preseason. But, yeah, I think Dan Curtin's a good D7 to, to maybe cover your, your Williams or your Coleman and and even like maybe a guy with a later buy, as you said, like a day cost. So I think for me, he's a, he's a D7. Um, but, yeah, if we're, we're just with Marty Hoare, what do you think his role is, is going to be in that Melbourne side? So I've already got 
um, Stephen May and Jake Lever there, and, and we don't sort of know where Harry Petty plays. Tomlinson's there. Do you think he's going to come in and play that third tall? Is he going to be a, a lockdown defender? May replace someone like a Joel Smith. Some, what, what do you think is going to happen with him? I think it really would depend a little bit on the domino effect of what happens with Clayton Oliver. I know that uh, fellow WA fantasy enthusiast Jeppa has been pumping up Trent Rivers all preseason. If Clayton happens to miss and Rivers moves for a little bit more midfield clock or up onto a wing, then maybe we see Marty Hoare as a bit more of like a rebounding and attacking defender. But yeah, it's tricky to try and squeeze him into that Melbourne team. That's why I have my doubts uh, whether he'll be there in round one. But if he is, I think he can score well enough. I probably have more faith in him scoring over Dan Curtin, to be honest. Like you said, they've got their May yeah. and Lever talls. Even if uh, Hoare does have to kind of play a similar role to Curtin as a third tall, I think, you know, like I said, he's a little bit older. He's had um, a couple of AFL games previously. He was a handy cash cow for us back in 2019 off the dome, maybe 2020. But, yeah, I think that he's uh, someone that if he's there, I'm not too concerned about what he'll score. Um, but, again, another bloke who does have one of those early buy rounds, which you have to take into consideration. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Um, just the other two that I just want to touch on, my mate being best mate being a North Melbourne fan, uh, he's quite uh, sort of high on Toby Pink and even like a, maybe a Riley Hardiman is a bit of a smoky guy that might get a game early. What do, what do you sort of know about those two fellas? Yeah, when I picked my first uh, team of the year, I put Hardiman into my D7, D8 spot. I think that he... He's a bit of a taller halfback flank. I think he played for Swan Districts over here in the Waffle last year. Um, and I don't think he would look out of place but, uh, in North's lineup, but I do think he'll be another player that will probably start the year in the VFL. Pinky might be a bit different. Mature age recruit, obviously, uh, it's been playing in the Sandful, I'm pretty sure, with Glenel last year. So if he's on your, uh, your bench, for example, and he's playing round one, he did average 51 in the Sandful last year. So you hope he can kind of churn out some similar scores. but. North Melbourne are a bit of a tricky team to try and predict their best 22. You know, there's talk of McCurtry going to the halfback flank. Uh, Zach Fisher's banged up and probably not necessarily ruled out of action, but you think a lot of the hardcore fantasy fans don't love picking a player at an interrupted preseason. So there's still a bit to play out with North, but I think it's definitely worth having Pink and Hardiman on your watch list. I think if uh, Hardiman comes in, I'll be putting him into my team. And Pinky, he might be another slow burn defender that can help us through the first portion of the season. Awesome, Tim. <laughs> well, who else you want to take us through, Fry? The other bloke that I've got my eye on is Jacob Ryan from the Pies. Now, <laughs> North Melbourne's uh, battling for position won't be too hard compared to the reigning premiers. I think Ryan had a strong season in the VFL last year. He's currently sitting on my bench, but there is a question mark on when, whether he'll actually be there round one. Um, I think that if I was Craig McRae and coaching the Pies, I'd give him another year in the VFL throw him in for a couple of senior games, maybe five or six throughout the year. But like I said, there is it does seem like there's a little bit of a, a need for Backman. Carl Warner's another – I'm just kind of swinging through a couple of names. Carl Warner's someone that played a few games for Frio last year. Um, there's a few people who have been asking me about Lawson Humphreys from Geelong. You've got Charlie Edwards, one of your fellow Crow boys, uh, Bales. Yep. But when you're looking for a lot of the cash cows in that really cheap price range, outside of Curtin – and probably Marty Hoare. There's not a lot of, that I'd trust on field at the moment. Uh, the only other one who jumps off the page a little bit to me is Josh Gipkis. Obviously, he had his hamstring issues last year. Uh, I think it was a debut season the year before that, so I don't exactly view him as a traditional third-year breakout, but uh, he's cheap, 256 k If you need a warm body and someone to score, then I have a hunch Richmond will be playing him a lot of games as well. The, the scorer, though, is he? No, nah, no, nah, not really. I 50s think, or um, something like that. Yeah, we might even be looking at 40s from him, to be yeah. honest. So, And that's I think that's gone into a lot of coaches thinking, you know, you're Nick Caulfield, who's not traditionally rookie priced, but he's someone with a high ownership at this point of the preseason. And I think there's coaches that will pay up for some of those more those expensive type of players um, and hope that that's where they can find a bit of value. No, I was certainly going to ask you about him. I thought, you know, obviously stretching it a little bit as a uh, as a rookie. But, um, I mean, there's some concerns, obviously, about how he might score. But um, what is his price? 348, break even at 40. I mean, you know, you'd think we've gotten 60s out of him in the past. Um, you, you know, it's it's not ideal. Um, but, um, but, you know, we are pretty, pretty thin back there. So, um, yeah. He's definitely someone to, um, to keep an eye on, you know, just... 
real and through his numbers, he's like you said, he's pretty much a career average of 60. Had 61 from 16 games back in 2021. So it comes at a massive discount from that. But yeah, it's tricky to try and find a lot of value in your basement type or your real cheap defenders. So hence the reason a lot of people will have someone like Dan Curtin sitting as their last on-field rookie. So we'll have to wait and see if anyone bobs up over the uh, the preseason or the Pracky games. Sure. Well, I've got well, one, one name for one. you before we move on. Um, that might be the just, same name I had as well. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Hopefully we've got more than we think. But um, a name that <laughs> I've heard getting around, and look, certainly not a team that you normally trust when it comes to uh, rookie players, but um, O'Shane Mullins from uh, Geelong. Uh, he's been getting a bit of talk. Uh, and, I mean, the other thing is, I can't remember, I think, whether he missed through injury time or any place, a handful of games or something along those lines. But the thing I do remember about, that, you know, being that he's that um, Irish kind of recruit, it seemed like Geelong were pretty keen to get some games into him and play him and see what he had. So, yeah, what, what, what can you tell us about um, Mullins, if anything? I do remember last year that uh, Zach Tui was calling him Geelong's version of Nick Dacos, so <laughs> not a bad uh, claim to fame. His average is a little bit affected by two sub games as well, where he was started the game as a sub, came on and scored a five and a nine. Um, and mixed in that, he's got you know a couple of 30s, a 40, a 50. I think with a full preseason under his belt, he is one of those speedster type players. Oh, as I look, it's actually his birthday today. Happy birthday, uh, Osman Allen. <laughs> <laughs> sure he's listening. Uh, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, th- the tricky thing is with a lot of those blokes, like your Gipkiss, your Mullen, um, someone like Hardeman, they're a little bit more expensive than a basement price rookie. But if they're there round one, there'll be a lot of coaches that will have to trust them for team structure-wise and to hopefully have uh, 30 green dots. So he is someone that I have my uh, eyes on, but I do wonder – what type of role he's going to play for the Cats. Will he continue to be the sub and be a bit of a high-impact, small defender type? Do they want him on the wing? Hasn't been a lot of buzz about him, um, with, with the exception of a couple of reports that have matched him. So, uh, yeah, I don't have tons for you, but someone that I have half an eye on, that's for sure. Well, the defender rookies are, are quite is sort of going to be important because, obviously, we saw the news today, unfortunately. Uh, Heath Chapman looks like he's going to miss the start of the season Mm. With a moderate hamstring injury, which which is unfortunate because I think a lot of coaches had sort of him as your D4, sort of uh, around that mark, maybe D5. So coaches might have to look to a to a Marty Hoare or, or a Dan Curtin on field, or even at someone that we won't speak about here because he's not really a rookie. Uh, he's a Nick Caulfield who's a little bit more than your rookie price players. But sort of the last player we'll touch on just before we move on to the midfield is his... Uh, one name we haven't spoken about is uh, Ari Schoenmaker, who got a bit of a bit of buzz at the start of preseason. Haven't heard as much since. Do you think that he's likely to get a game early, or do you think he's maybe a guy we look at maybe in somewhere in the mid season to later parts of the year? I think he's probably a later season play. You must have read my mind, Bales, because I was about to touch <laughs> on him before we uh, bail. There you but, go. Uh, yeah, one of the last picks in the draft, booming kick. I think that uh, a lot of the. Uh, this word on scouts and a lot of the AFL footy uh, enthusiasts that were talking about him around the draft rave about him. He was suspended for start of his uh, junior se- his final junior season, but he can score. He had, I think it was about 27 disposals a game playing for the Tassie Devils and 24 of those were kicks. So if he comes in, then he'll definitely be an option for coaches. Given the way that St Kilda's list is structured up and they've got a lot, probably want to uh, make another leap in production this year. I do think that he'll be someone that starts the season in the VFL, but one to watch as the season progresses for sure. Yep. All right, should we move on to the next line then? Let's. Uh, how many on-field cash cows or rookies do you have in your midfield, lads? Currently got three for me. i got two. Yeah, Ooh. see, I've chopped and changed a bit between the two and three uh, with different iterations of my team, but I think the two you probably have, Tim, would be Colby McKercher and Riley Sanders. Yeah, and, and I particularly think after, sorry, yeah, 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 the, um, particularly after the, the oh, well, yeah, I mean, you're the Frio man, right? So why don't you tell us about the Pracky match yesterday, right? Yeah, well, well uh, Jeremy in the club, sorry. is, yeah, yeah, he's the one who is probably toggling in and out of that last on-field spot for me. And I do remember um, the role that he played for fantasy coaches back when he was a Gold Coast son, he came on, obviously, late in the year, the last five or six weeks, and scored very healthily. I don't think he's going to have the same access to points at the Dockers. There's a lot of players that seem to be fighting for that wing role. Um, there was times where Brayshaw played it last year. There's been talk of 
James Aish or uh, some other bits and pieces like floating from a half back line to a wing, Nathan O'Driscoll. The list goes on. There's a lot of players fighting for that particular spot. So Sharpie's still relatively young. He's 23, and I think Frio would have been chuffed to get him over and maybe have a bit of a long-term view of uh, having him in their side. But he is someone that I'm just going to very cautiously watch over the preseason. I don't think he's as much of a, a round one lock as some coaches may think. But if he's there, then I'll be paying up for him and picking him a little bit based on his previous scoring history and uh, hopefully from what he can produce for Frio. Yeah, I think with with especially when Schmucky joined uh, Warney and the boys and was saying about how like Sharpie's probably the one that's at the top there, and the fact that with Chapman going down as well, I think that's an extra spot there that's that's open for him. I think uh, Ace may move to that sort of half backish type role. So I think that I think Sharp has has got a good shot if he can if he can uh, show some good signs in Frio's pracky game. So um, he's currently my M eight, but I know as you say, I know that's the probably. He's the guy that a few people may be going up to a Wardlaw or or someone around that price, um, or even like a, a, a Sheldrick or someone around there. But uh, yeah, I think Sharp could be yeah all the way up. Jeez, why not, baby? <laughs> How much why cash not? you got, Tim? You got to give me some of that cash, mate. That's right, infinite wealth, baby, infinite wealth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I have currently have Sharp sitting at M eight, and I think uh, barring any major uh, changes or upsets. I think he'll stay in that spot, but he's someone that has kind of gone on and off of my field. I think I'm just resorting back to you know, what we just talked about with the rookies available in defence. I don't think we'll spend long talking about the ruck rookies, and then there's you can throw a blanket over a lot of guys in the forward line. I don't hate the idea of having three genuine rookies in the midfield. It's very traditional, obviously. It's kind of going with... Uh, the same grain that everyone goes with, but I think that's where we're going to get most of our points and our value. So um, having a couple of blokes, you know, sacrificing elsewhere to afford to have those little cash cows, I think is uh, probably a strong play. I'm also Absolutely. leaning with the best 18 in those buy rounds, early buy rounds as well. I'm just kind Very of, I'm just yeah. trying to get as many of those high scoring players on field as possible. Yeah. And yeah, I think early buy rounds, rounds. Go on, you go, Babs. I was just as a, uh, Luke from Ball Boys is saying it would be good if we get some of those forward spots where we're going to put maybe a couple of those rookies or guys we're not sure about, put two of the places into the mid so we can uh, play a few more of these uh, rookies and value guys. Um, so, Warnie, mate, if you can make that happen for us. <laughs> yeah, we see you listening, Warn. Go and hit the red button. <laughs> yeah, I think um, there's a lot of value to be had throughout the midfield for the entire season um, and whether you want to tweak your structure to have two or three is not going to make or break your year. But I think the midfield line is obviously where we have um, probably the most fruitful cash cows, let's call them. And Colby McKercher and Riley Sanders are a cut above the rest. I wouldn't be shocked if those two were fighting it out for Rising Star Award with some of the other uh, blokes that didn't qualify from last year. But yeah, I think uh, Sharpie's another interesting one to, to talk about. All right, well, let's take us through some of the other uh, midfield rookies. that you th- I mean, I'm trying to, I'm the, you know, I get pretty low, especially when it comes to those bench rookies. So uh, who do you think we can uh, it's all good, mate. That's, there? that's why I'm here. I've done my homework. Uh, Clay Hall good. is the one that I'm really high on. Um, Come on, the Eagles. Come on, the Eagles. He, he did actually uh, play at the same junior footy club as me, and I didn't teach him anything, so he should actually <laughs> be pretty good at footy. Um, <laughs> he is uh, your carbon copy, 200K basement rookie. He's a inside ball, I think if West Coast gives him a game early, he'll be a virtual lock for every smart fantasy coach. Uh, the question is, obviously, is he going to be in their round one side? I think he's shown a lot of uh, promise throughout the preseason thus far, so there's no reason to suggest he won't be there. Uh, ownership of 20% as it sits right now, and I only really expect that to climb. I think he'll, uh, he probably won't be a, a you know 80% tog, 75% tog type of rookie, but even if he gets subbed or where's the sub vest i think if we trust him on the bench he'll generate us plenty of coin uh, throughout the first portion of the year so do you have any of his junior i mean look i should know about him right he's from my team but i've only actually started hearing his name in the last like week or so um do you know much about his junior numbers yeah so he played with peel thunder um and similar to dan Curtin, he started the year in the colts and then after the under 18 champs games he started getting league games for peel so he averaged about 19 disposals in Waffle League uh, from nine games with Peel Thunder, and in those games averaged 67. So uh, he s- scored a boatload as well in the Colts and the under-18s comp. But like I said, that kind of a bit bit more built than uh, a lot of rookies entering the system, and I think that that'll hold him in good stead. And obviously playing 
senior footy, whether it be in South Australia, WA, uh, Victoria, whatever, that's going to put you in good stead to burst out of the blocks to start the year. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, well, two two rookies that have been getting a lot of uh, buzz, um, especially in the preseason as well. A little bit more expensive than Baseman, um, about that 230, 240k range is Matt Roberts and Jai Clark. So obviously Roberts just sounds like he might have a potential half-back role. Uh, well, that's what he's been doing in intra-club. Obviously, we know you've got to have sort of double of every position in the intra-club. But uh, talk mm. to us about probably those, those duo because we've sort of seen them before, which could be uh, something that maybe coaches look for. Yeah, that's the tricky thing with Matty Roberts, right? Like we saw him kind of just bounce in and out of that sub vest a bit like Sheldrick did before he popped. So if Roberts is playing on the half back line, and that's one thing that coaches can watch out for during these practice games and the preseason hit outs, is if Roberts is playing the majority of his footy running around that half back line, that probably gives me a little bit more confidence in him. Like you said, Bales priced at 245. He didn't have a great season last year. He averaged 30 from his six games, but again, there's a couple of sub-affected scores in there. So I do have a bit of confidence in Matty Roberts and it would be very and some convenient. a couple of monsters too, wasn't there? Um, was there some big scores? Check. I know that Sheldrick was the one that was popping for part of the last year, but Matty Roberts... I've heard that he's got he's got he's normally got a pre, he's had a good junior record. I think he had good numbers in um for in SA and S Anfield. So um no, 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 he didn't. Sorry, he didn't. But I think I remember being pretty impressed with him when he did come on. Yeah, I'll see mate. if I can quickly get up his state league stats because nah. it seems like there's a couple of those blokes that you know they get buried in the midfield depth chart, then they move to a half back line. All of a sudden, they start scoring seventies and eighties or you know sixties at least. Um, so. Yeah, like you said, Bales, another one was um, Jai Clark. Had a lot of injury issues last year. And I think off the dome he had some for, during his uh, final junior year as well. But he was a, touted as a Joel Selwood clone. So if he is given game time and he's able to kind of run through the midfield for Geelong, then you'd think that there's points there. I do have some doubts. I actually have doubts, to be honest, about Geelong as a entirety. I'm not really sure. Uh, how they're going to structure their team. Are they going to embrace a lot of the old guys and really try and have one more tilt? Are they going to, you know, slightly tweak it and give games into your blokes like Joe Clark, Sean Manor, a couple of these other guys. Hope that Tanner Bruin can be the midfield star. So that gives me a little bit of pause around Joe Clark. If I had to pick between the two, I'd probably trust Matty Roberts slightly. But both guys, I think, uh, are ones to watch throughout the preseason. And if they are, named round one, then it'll become uh, popular picks for sure. Yeah, well, Jai Clark, I think, would he have the most points per minute of any player last year, but he only obviously played the one quarter and scored, what was it, 37 points with five tackles. So at least yeah, we, yeah, tackles we sort of right. got it. Yeah, we got that bit of a bit of a taste that he can actually, like, if he can get those tackles and, and get a little bit of the ball playing that Geelong midfield, he could make some cash quickly. But as you say, though, we sort of just don't really know what Geelong are going to do, which is sort of they haven't really said if they're um, if they're still going to be going for a premiership tilt or if they're going to be uh, trusting a bit of these young players. Yeah, and the tricky thing, I mean, these early buy rounds are going to cause a lot of uh, different tactics to be employed. But you know, you probably want those guys to be generating yeah uh, tons of money in the first portion of the year. Do you, does that mean you steer towards someone like Jai Clark over Matty Roberts because he's potentially going to play another game? Maybe when you pick your starting side, but by the time you get to round three or four, that might be completely balls up. So, again, I think I have a little bit more faith in Matty Roberts, but uh, I haven't taken my eyes off uh, either of them. I think that there'll be players that I watch closely uh, in the preseason hit outs. Yeah, the good thing with Matty Roberts is he, he's got that opening round game. So, we actually get to see him in a proper AFL game first. And, and if uh, he doesn't play or doesn't show much, then I think the decision could always be made really for us. Yeah, I agree. One of the other blokes uh, in that similar price range, as I look through the list that I've got, is uh, Josh Sin as well. Hasn't really had a complete run at it at AFL level. A couple of injuries here and there, but he's someone that I think Port Adelaide are very eager to squeeze into their best 22. It's just a matter of if he can keep his body right, because if he's playing early, um, I do have a lot of faith that he can score reasonably well. Yeah. First up against West Coast as well. Yeah, that does. Is that over here as well? Oh, jeez. Now you're asking me. Yeah, I'm testing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think regardless, I do think. Adelaide Oval, yeah. Adelaide yeah, Oval. Yeah, yeah it's, he was the sub from memory last year. I'm having a look at his uh, 
box score, for lack of a better term now. He's only played three games last year, averaged 19 fantasy points. So that tells me he didn't get a clean run of it. Yeah, sub, I think, for all those yeah. games. So, yeah, you know, it, maybe he just slots straight into that slub role for Port again. And if that's the case, there's probably not going to be the cash generation we want. So, again, like we said earlier, there are a couple of options. You know, we've listed three guys in the mid-200s. There's a couple of basement guys. Cade McAuliffe from Richmond is someone that's worth uh, keeping on your watch list as well as they kind of enter a new era. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity up for grabs to pick good rookies in the midfield. It's just going to be a little bit of a matter of wait and see. Yeah. What All about right. uh, what about um, uh, Warney's boy, um, Binzi? Uh, is uh, is he going to do what? Do you think he cracks into Cullen's best 22 and gets a game? Oh, I wish. If I had a dollar for every time I wrote his names in one of my articles last year, I could <laughs> I could buy Carlton, I reckon. But, yeah, maybe he does. He's dominated in the VFL, had a lot of uh, big bo- uh, stats, and that kind of jumped off the page for fantasy coaches. We're hoping he gets a run. But I, I'm not exactly with Sam McClure in saying that Carlton are premiership favourites, but I do think that they're one of the genuine contenders. So squeezing Jackson Binns in to get a couple of games probably isn't at the top of Michael Voss's uh, – thoughts but again if he comes out and lights up the preseason uh he will have a round two by but i don't think that'll deter us too much again round one yeah um final two names just here just before we move on to the other positions as well was uh um jake rogers who a few people have uh, obviously have put on their watch list he was obviously an academy pick for them and also uh god they got a bit of uh, chat from uh i think it was uh jeff and tazy yesterday at the game is a uh, cooper simpson from um, Frio. Mm. So about those two boys and maybe even Ed Allen as well. I've heard, heard a bit of talk about him. Any of those three guys do you see getting game early? Um, I do like the idea of Cooper Simpson getting a game early. Mid-forward status. So he's actually sitting at my uh, M7, uh, M9 m spot at the moment. So does allow you to have a handy, versatile uh, player. You can switch between a couple of positions there. He's Seems like he hasn't put a foot wrong this preseason. I loved him when they drafted him. I promise I won't let my purple bias influence it too much. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm confident that he can at least score in good patches. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good player comp. But he does, he'll does. he probably slot a bit into like a half-forward role, uh, maybe even get buried a bit deeper, somewhat to what Lockie Schultz was doing for Freo last year, maybe. Um, yep. And if that's the case, then he should have access to points. The other two, Ed Allen... I do fall a little bit into the same basket that I was saying about Binzi. They're probably focusing on his development and maybe he'll get a few games this year, but the reigning premiers aren't uh, too concerned about depth. So. Yeah, yeah, just got a bit, just got a pretty good team there, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's close all right. But he is um, someone that I like the looks of. I think uh, obviously failed to make his debut last year, so as a result, he's 200K now. If he's uh, starting round one or even if he comes in, you know, around seven or eight, I think that he's someone that you can put onto your bench and he should score well, just got to avoid the uh, dreaded vest. Um, and Jake Rogers, probably a bit more of a long-term project. There is, yeah. uh, Dimmer Hardwick's going to want to come in and, you know, move magnets around and do a lot to instantly try and get Ws on the board. And I think to do that, he'll roll with the midfield group of your Rouse, uh, Noah Anderson, Tuke Miller. So there's a lot of mouths to feed in Gold Coast midfield. So I wonder if Rogers will get a serious crack at it. Might play a couple of games, but he'll probably, uh, yeah, maybe be uh, vested or low tog. But I think that he's someone we can kind of wait on, especially because he was a higher draft pick. to set you back 260K. So there's other options that probably like a bit more than Rogers. Yeah, cool. All right, let's move it on to the ruck line. Uh, my R3 at the moment is Harry Barnett uh, from West Coast. Have you boys got uh, good old Max Heath floating there? At the moment, yeah. It's mine's been yeah, so, floating. Mine's been floating between. I've I've currently got Heath there. I need to cash after Chapman going out. Just a bit of a quick change. But I've uh, had the uh, Jordan Sweet there. Toby Conway both made their way. Obviously they're quite expensive, so probably we might be a touch on a tiny bit. But they're more not really rookie price. But uh, yeah, Max Heath has been the more common guy that's been there. But, yeah. Yeah. Tell us about Barnett. Uh well, drafted last or not last year, the year before. Uh, didn't light it up in the waffle. For West Coast, but when he was arriving in WA, everyone was touting him as Nick Nat's successor. He averaged 50 with 15 hitouts while playing for West Coast's uh, reserve squad. I think the big reason why I'm leaning towards picking him, I don't expect him to play a ton, but from a loophole standpoint, everyone usually throws away a lot of your R3 spots, right? And 
Fremantle or West Coast tends to be playing the final game on a Sunday. So I've just kind of defaulted to picking a West Coast guy and hoping that uh, it allows me to wait a little bit uh, later into the round to try and make my uh, VC and captain options. But in saying that, I don't think uh, there's too many rookies in this ruck spot that interests me from a basement standpoint. But uh, yeah, I don't think Max Heat's going to play a lot. <laughs> it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty. Uh, um, I'm just looking at. It's pretty horrible when uh, when the, the best thing going for him is he play often plays the last game of the round. <laughs> Genuinely, yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, the big reason why I'm picking him is hopefully he doesn't play a game. Yeah. So. so yeah. Not, yeah. Not just too much. In, Quickly on those other blokes you mentioned, Bales, because I did um, one of the deck of DT pieces I did was on Jordan Sweet uh, for the Traders boys. It's it's a genuine option. I don't know if he's going to be sole ruck, which probably gives me the biggest pause. I had him in my team as I was writing the article, and <laughs> the more I got into it, the more I thought, am I really going to pay an extra 180 bucks for someone that might score 40 or might not even be in the team? But, you know, if Soldo goes out the first preseason game, injures his finger that he had off-season surgery on again, maybe it opens the door for Sweet to be a 65-type averaging player. So having that cash in your back pocket to potentially grab Sweet or someone else, you mentioned Toby Conway, if he emerges as a uh, player that's going to play regularly and feature for Geelong, it's not a terrible idea because usually, as I said, we tend to ignore this spot. We pick a bloke that's going to be our uh, player that goes on our field as our non-playing captain. So it might be a nice... Uh, left field pivot to try and pay up a little bit and get a head start on the rest of the competition early. I think the, yeah, the, thing, so, the, re, the, re, as I said, the reason I think people are looking at paying up a bit for their R3s is if they're starting Gorn and Grundy um, because they both got that early buy. I think mm. it's a bit different if you just got Grundy or if you got Grundy and Cherry, maybe you don't have to pay up. But I think, yeah, with the Gorn and Grundy kind, that's maybe something that I guess someone like myself has been uh, contemplating starting something a bit uh, more expensive just to get that playing guy um, in round All five right. and six. So this is what I was going to say before. Timbo's hot take. What the hell does it matter? There's 18 – it's 18 on field. We don't yeah. need an R3. We and don't need an expensive R3 to cover one of those ruck positions. A couple of the podcasts talk about it. And look, I kind of get the thinking, but it's best 18 anyway. You can cross out four of your players. It's not, not an issue get, having get, a, a non-playing – yeah, it's not an issue having a non-playing player at, at R2 or R1. So – and they're on different buy rounds, so – um, look, I mean, you know, if, you, if you're structuring your team to you get the, you know, I mean, the most cash on field and you're trying to get the, the best value players, um, I wouldn't be worried about a, a playing our throw. And funny you actually said that because I was actually, because I'm currently I'm in Melbourne and I was uh, just caught up with uh, Liam before, obviously free kick Liam. Uh, if you haven't followed him, he's legend. Make sure you go and do that. Uh, but uh, I was chatting to him about that and said I had sweet there and I said that I've toyed with maybe just going a cheap, basement guy just because I'll still have 21 in both the weeks anyway. Obviously, you've got to make sure you don't have guys that have buyers in other weeks. But, yeah, that's uh, yeah, it is a good point you raised, Tim, because I haven't heard actually anyone speaking about that on any of the pods yet. Very smart. If we get to the point as well where it looks like he's a pick for round one, a lot can change by the time we get to round five or six and these guys are having their week off, right? Yeah, what's the, yeah, yeah. What's, the, what's, the say, what's the say Sweet has a solo ruck in round one? goes okay, but then Port bring in uh, sold in round two and you've paid up nearly 400k for a guy sharing a ruck probably 50-50, so yes. And it's a restructure as well to fix that spot. You've got no one to parachute to, whereas at the moment we can leave Sweet, uh, you know, sitting there as a parachute if something does go wrong with Gorn or Grundy and he can't get up to the top. Yeah, valid point. Yep. All right, so uh, cupboard's pretty bare in the ruck situation there. <laughs> yeah, I I really wish there was, you know, a genuine ruck player that we could pick, like one of these North Melbourne draftees or another basement price bloke. But even Ethan Reid, the uh, Gold Coast draftee, he's going to be buried behind Jared Witts. Lockie McAndrew from last year, he's a bit too expensive. Mitch Edwards, who I uh, kind of wanted Frio to grab. I don't think he's playing for Geelong. Dante Vicentini at Port Adelaide, which talked about sweet. So I don't think uh, he'll be... Uh, overtaking him in the depth chart and I won't read any of these other names off to you because your time is valuable, boys. <laughs> <laughs> so are our listeners. All right, yeah, exactly. let's move on to the forwards. Let's move on to the forwards. Hit us up, mate. Talk us through the uh, the most relevant forward rooks. Well, I won't talk at length about Harley Reid, the most popular player in the game. Sorry, uh, who? Haven't heard him, mate. Uh, <laughs> If you, if you lived over in WA, you just turn to the back page of the uh, paper. and yeah, he's there like, every day. Yeah, he's literally... Premier, premier of WA. The way he's going around. Um, 
but yeah, there are a lot of uh, forward options that I like the looks of. The one that I'm struggling to pinpoint the most at this stage is Finn McRae. A little bit dearer than yeah. basement price, but I've just talked at length about why Ed Allen and uh, Jacob Ryan won't get into a Premier's midfield. But Taylor Adams goes. Is Finn McRae the one that kind of plays a bit of half forward and pinch hits in the midfield? Maybe. Does he finally shake that sub vest? Because if he does, I think he could be a player that uh, is not only worth picking, but maybe someone that we can trust on our field as well. Yeah, and if they've, because they've obviously done this whole 23 players to get named, we don't know who's going to be the sub. And Finn McRae, just unfortunately with that, with that rule change coming in, screams sub vest, even if he is named on a half forward flank or is subbed yep. off halfway through the game, which is could be something that causes a bit of an issue, especially when we're trying to score as, as many points as possible if he's on your field. If he's on your bench, it might not. Well, yet then again, you're paying 310k for a guy that could be a sub. So maybe if that's the case, then we just steer clear. But the good thing is we get to watch him at least in opening round so he can sort of get a gauge. Yeah, that's what I was just about to say. We do get a little uh, sticky beak at him first, but he's someone that I think out of all the cheap rookies, he's probably one of the most popular ones that coaches will be Stick it on your field. Um, another bloke that some coaches may be rocking with is Zane Dersma, high draft pick from North Melbourne. I think he is cut from a similar cloth to what we saw Jacob Van Ruin do last year. He'll probably play, you know, 15 to 17 games, but don't go expecting him to score 60 or 70 every week. There might be some 30s and 40s in there. Uh, however, again, another player that doesn't have an early buyer. He also owns mid forward status. So that's another handy string in his bow. He's someone that's in my team, and I think at 291k, tricky to squeeze him onto your field points-wise, but I think he's definitely worth having. One guy I want you to chat about now is I've, I've been looking at this guy. There's been a lot of buzz about him coming out of Melbourne. Caleb Windsor. Chat to us mm. about him. What do, you, what do you think about him? Yeah, so when uh, I picked my first squad, I was actually trying to – try and make room for Windsor. And then I was like, ah, he's probably not going to play. He's not going to be great. Then, of course, he lights up a 20 seconds of play at uh, Melbourne's preseason hit out. And then all of a sudden, everyone's touting him as the next big thing. So, <laughs> again, another mid-forward. Um, he does have a pretty good uh, track record of scoring as well. He does excel as one of those outside, like, line breakers. And we saw there's been clips of him where, you know, he's kicked the footy down the line and then he's got the handball back off the bloke he kicked it to. So I do expect him to score well if he does get a gig for uh, Melbourne early. It'll just be a matter of if they can squeeze him into the side and they can change a little bit of their structure. I think they will, though. I think he's someone that his ownership's only going to keep going up. Um, and if, you know, you're talking about uh, Finn McRae, uh, Dersma, and then Caleb Windsor, I probably have the most faith in Windsor from a scoring standpoint. Um but with a lot of these tall uh, early draft picks, he maybe gets a little bit uh, rested or vested, uh, which wouldn't be ideal. But I do think that there's enough uh, value there if the D's pick him that I'll be picking him too. Yeah, and he's got that, again, another player opening rounds, mm. a lot of these. It, I think it'll be – I know Tim was chatting to me off um, sort of off, uh, off camera, off mics, wherever you want to call it, and saying that, yeah, these rookies and mid-prices that play opening round that – have a big game are going to be important um, just because they're going to have that double cash rise and go up quickly. And if you see something from the Windsor or Finn McRae or someone like that, that could be sort of quite um, sort of beneficial. So, yeah, definitely one to watch. Do you see him getting into the team? Obviously, you said a bit more outside, so I assume maybe a wing slash sort of maybe half back, half forward role. But I think Melbourne have got quite an abundance, especially of wingmen with obviously Hunter and and um, Ed Langdon. Then they got some half backs and half forward. Do you see him cracking into that best 22? Yeah, I agree. I think that that wing role would be perfectly suited for him. But as you just said, Bales, there's you know there's a lot of talent rolling through that Melbourne midfield, regardless of if Oliver's there or not. Langdon and Hunter are locks pretty much for the wing each week. Uh, Tom Sparrow seems like he's ready to take his game to new heights. So I don't know if he's going to get as much midfield time, in quotation marks, for, for people listening. It's... Uh, <laughs> what are we, about 50, 48 minutes into the podcast. It took us to mention more midfield time. So well done, boys. Um, yeah, uh, maybe... yeah four, four, 43 minutes into the into the podcast. Yeah, we like go. to do reckon, things different here. I reckon that's <laughs> the longest of any uh, fantasy podcast I've heard this year. So well done, lads. Um, thanks, thanks, But, mate. yeah, back to the point you were mentioning, maybe he does start on a half forward. It does depend a bit on their structure, whether they want to go with, um, you know, your Joel Smith, like you said, Harrison Petty kind of bounce around all over the place. Um, but I do think that there's enough talent there for Melbourne to just kind of find room for him. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, two other players, obviously quite popular names that people have got in there. Sean Manor and Darcy Wilson are the two of the names that people have got floating in their side. So can you tell us a bit more about those guys? I think you touched a little bit on Sean Manor a tiny bit before, but yeah, those two guys. Yeah, slightly. It's tricky to get a read out of Geelong, like I've said before, but I think if Sean Manor is playing, that every coach should have him. He's obviously basement. He's a mature rager. He's dominated for Werribee last year. Most people will know about how he dominated the VFL Grand Final as well. So mm. he's in 44% of teams for a reason. I'm not sure that he'll be in their round one team to clash with St Kilda. And on the other side, I don't know if um, Darcy Wilson will have a run as well for the Saints. But he's somewhat similar to Caleb Windsor. He's a bit of a uh, – excels as kind of an outside runner. Um, I'd probably like Wilson mm, – his, his ball use is a little bit better than Caleb Windsor's, but I feel like Windsor does a better job of just getting the ball in his hands. So uh, they're two players that I view as ones to watch. Uh, I probably will rate Manor a bit higher. Darcy Wilson seems like he will start in uh, Sandringham for St Kilda and then hopefully build up to an AFL debut, whereas Manor, if he can light it up early in these preseason games and throw his uh, mature body around, maybe he's someone that he's picked earlier and we can trust as a, a bench cash cow. Yeah. Two players just as well. Uh, another two here we got. Uh, Darcy Jones obviously had last year, unfortunately, ruled out with his ACL, but he's apparently Toby Green mentioned him early in the preseason as someone that he um, could see potentially getting a game. And uh, my mate, Burjo, Chris Burgess, do you see him getting a game for the Crows? Because I'm not quite sure he does. Nah, Burjo is someone that when I was making my initial team, I put there, but I've actually swapped him out for Aaron Cadman. So I kind of view Burgess as a, a worse version of Aaron Cadman. So that tells you probably all you need to know. I think <laughs> he could play uh, a, a role for Adelaide, but another team that's obviously very keen to uh, make amends for their uh, finish last year. I don't think that they can really squeeze Burgess in. Um, hey, 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 we got screwed by the umpire. No, I'm joking. Now we lost a heap of games by listening guys. That's fine. Yeah, but you did get screwed by the umpire's bails. That's fair. So I, I do hold a, a little bit of a joy in watching the crowd and, succeed. So. And, and, I was, and I was in Perth with no one to sort of chat about it with. Everyone was sort of just not really paying too much attention. So... But yeah. Anyway, we'll, we're, that's last year. Hopefully, Crows make finals this year, and hopefully, uh, we go all right. But yes, yeah, we're, we're moving on. Aren't we? We're moving on. Aren't we? <laughs> yeah. we're putting it behind us and moving on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I have faith that uh, Adelaide will do well. I don't have faith that uh, Chris Burgess will be in the team to succeed, though. Um, yes. Another forward who no one's really talking about, and it's it is a little bit left field. I'll be honest, but he's in about five and a half percent of teams. Is Arazio Fantasia now? Mm. He has oh. that round two by uh, two hundred and sixty nine. He's twenty eight years old. He has been banged up. He actually hasn't cracked his uh, hundred game. I'm pretty sure because I was doing a bit of research earlier. And I was surprised to see that he's played what feels like 15 seasons and he hasn't appeared in 100 AFL games. But if, you know, Carlton did lack a little bit from a scoring standpoint, if he squeezes his way into their starting outfit, it's not a traditional pick, but it's someone that I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him over the first half a dozen rounds, et cetera, um, be a nice bench rookie that can make us 100, 150K. Uh, someone that I haven't squeezed into my team, but like I said, he's a bit on my radar. Um, who else have I got for you? Nick Watson, I don't think we can really trust him as a small forward from the Hawks, but I, I think it would be very exciting to watch. Um, Someone we haven't talked about yet that's on my watch list is Braden George. At, uh, I was going to say him, yep, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, I skipped over Darcy Jones as well. And I'll be honest, Braden George and Darcy Jones, having been drafted and then you know not really doing a ton in their early portion of their career, now has 200K options. They're, to, they're stereotypical examples of players that we can watch during the preseason, but take their score with a little bit of a grain of salt. I'm just going to be really looking on their role. Like if Darcy Jones is, like Toby Green said, excelling as a uh, pitch hitter through the midfield and he's playing a lot of tog, those are the things I'm looking out for rather than what he scores. And George is quite similar as well. I've talked about how there's a lot of young talent now at North Melbourne and they'll be all fighting for positions there. But if we can see someone like George uh, excelling on a half-forward flank or maybe even off the half-back line, then uh, he's another player that I think we can definitely have a look at at the basement price. 
Yeah. Uh, just the other two names you just haven't really said too much on. I'm not sure what your thoughts are on them, but someone like a Nate Caddy or even a Kyle Lohman, a, f- a few people have, have thrown up. What Do you think maybe they're not quite – we're looking at them, or what do you reckon about those two? Yeah, Nate Caddy, I think he's a bit t- – he's the taller forward from memory. I'll be honest, I haven't dug a ton into his numbers. Uh, I don't think that's – as a key forward, he's going to be scoring great. His numbers in the um, juniors last year, he did average 86 playing in um, the Coates Talent League, but he kicked nearly three goals a game from that. I don't know if he's going to average three goals a game for the Bombers. So he could be a, a 50s top scorer if uh, Essendon give him early games. Um, but who was the other bloke you mentioned? Sorry, Bales. Uh, Kyle Lohman. Yes, he's someone uh, that actually has bounced in and out of my team, I think. He's had a couple of uh, pre-seasons now. He's only 20, but he's not exactly an expensive forward rookie you have to pay up for. If he's playing, you know, as the uh, sidekick to Charlie Cameron, though, up forward, and guys like Zach Bailey and Cam Rayner are pushing further up the ground, then there's probably not going to be an access to a huge amount of points for Kyle Lohman. But, yeah, there's a lot of players that you can pick from when you're choosing your forwards uh, rooks. And I think that Kyle Lohman... Darcy Jones, all the Braden George. We've reeled off probably fifteen different names, um, and they have a lot of different uh, abilities. You know, you know, yeah. Caddy, another key forward. So, a lot of those forwards, I'm really just going to be watching for role, and a bit more importantly as well, when it gets to closer to round one, is how much they are playing in these preseason games. Are they playing a half and then they're off? Are they giving a really serious run? Um, what? What do they look like role-wise? Are they just kind of buried in the forward line or you know, pitch hitting on the outside as a win? Those are the things I think that as you get into the nitty-gritty before the season, the real season starts, that's what you kind of want to look out for. Because you look at their box score and their points, all of a sudden Nate Caddy's got 68 points and he's kicked two goals three. A lot of people might jump on him. But, um, yeah, there's just a couple of bits and pieces you might want to look out for as uh, the preseason games gear up. Yeah. Yeah, great points you raised there, Fry, mate. All right, mate. Well, look, you've detailed uh, plenty of forwards for us there, which is good because, uh, I mean, I think a lot of coaches are going to be looking uh, for some value options, particularly in that forward line this year, considering mm. it's so depleted of, oh, you know, high-scoring fantasy talent. But um, so, I don't know, it gives me a little bit of, uh, I don't know, comfort to know that we've got plenty of stocks here in the forward line. But, mate, uh, any kind of last things you want to say about rookies or, uh, you know, how they might be impacting your team in terms of structure? I mean, how are you kind of structuring up in your, in your team so far? I think similar to uh, years past, I'm not afraid to pay up for some of these more expensive rookies. And in in the past, you know, a lot of people will want just 200K blokes on the bench, but we talked a lot about Dan Curtin at the start of the episode. I think if you can afford to put him on your defensive bench, that's an ideal tactic. Obviously, he can then help cover your likes of Zach Williams and Nick Dacos, worst case scenario. Uh, so don't be afraid to spend a little bit more on bench players. Maybe don't spend uh, enough on Jordan Sweet, but uh, if you want to pay up in the forward line and you know put Finn McRae at F7 to go alongside a, a Dersma type, uh, it's... It's not a terrible tactic because it does, you know, worst case scenario, they're in for two weeks and then they're out. They're Mm -hmm. a little bit inflated in price. And as I listed off, there's a lot of forward options you can uh, jump off to. So, yeah, don't be afraid to pay up on the bench and try and obviously get as many green dots as you can closer to round one. Awesome, mate. Awesome. Well, uh, we're just going to turn to some questions now and uh, see if we, I mean, look, obviously we covered a lot of players, right? So we're going to see if there's anything in particular we missed or any other questions that people want to go through. Bales, have you got some questions there, mate? Yeah, just got a just got a couple, just a couple of names we probably didn't quite touch on. So the first one's uh, so from Rids, obviously a uh, member of the coaches panel, mate. Thanks for tuning in and sending it through. Uh, but he said Bailey Laurie from obviously the Ds. Is he potentially a guy that we, we've got to look at as well? Uh, I don't think so. I think that there's guys who I'd prefer over him um, and I can't see him squeezing into Melbourne's team a lot. Like we've just talked quite a bit about Caleb Windsor um, trying to find a role there. There are a couple of, obviously you lost Harms and Jordan that does open up a couple of spots, but yeah, I don't have a ton of confidence that we'll see a lot out of him this year. But again, if he comes out of the preseason and there's an exciting role and we see something that we like, that might change our thinking slightly. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, yeah definitely one to put on the list. But yeah, I think Melbourne's a pretty tough team to 
to get into. Uh, we got one here from John. He said, what about the news about uh, Buki Karmas off halfback for the Dogs? Yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I think he's a little bit uh, dearer as well at 314K. So if you were tossing up between him and Finn McRae and they're both playing round one, I'll probably want Finn McRae. Uh, if you can afford to put him on your bench and for whatever reason, a couple of the blokes we've already mentioned aren't named early, then maybe it's a route you can go down. It'd be very handy if he could pick up defensive status as well. But I think we've seen enough of Buku Karmas to know that he's not going to be a huge game-changing fantasy player. Uh, might prove me wrong, but uh, I'm, I'm fairly confident that he's someone we can pass on. Yeah, and then Simon uh, also asked about Harvey Gallagher from the Dogs as well. Yeah, someone that they seem to love internally, and there's a lot of people that mention his name. Uh, obviously, had a bit of a interrupted preseason last year, and for that reason, he only played nine VFL games. Average 53, and I don't think he made his AFL debut, but he might have been listed as an emergency a few times. So someone that we could watch. Uh, I can't see him squeezing into the round one team for the doggies. Maybe they proved me wrong, but yeah, someone to hit that little star button. He's a perfect example of someone to have in your favourites um, and just monitor how he goes, but I don't know if he'll be there round one. Yeah. Um, Corey was just saying, Corey Blackledge on YouTube was just saying this here because I know that he is a North Melbourne fan. He said he sees Pink as depth as Callan Dawson and Combin will be ahead uh, and also Corey as well. So that is a good point, Corey, you raise there because I know that uh, Combin has been training it uh, down back and obviously got Corey there as well and Callan Dawson's played. So do you think it's going to be one of Dawson or Pink in the side, Fry? Yeah, I think they'll probably lead. It's a tricky thing, right? Like with North, they obviously want to try and not be stuck at the bottom of the ladder, but you can get some games into your kids, but you're still obviously going to try and find the middle ground. Toby Pink, is he going to play in their next finals team? Maybe not. Dawson might, though. Obviously, you give him a bit of a run at it, or someone like a Riley Hardiman. Uh, maybe they're the type of players that they hope can kind of level up their game as the rest of their roster uh, naturally progresses. Again, like I said with Pink, I think he is really a depth piece. Um, there's been a lot of pieces that I've seen of Charlie Comden doing kickouts and like we talked about before, Colby McKercher starring off the half back line. Haven't seen a lot of Toby Pink highlights. So uh, yeah, I think a lot of, uh, what are we sitting at? He's about 30, 40% owned. I think a lot of those coaches will have to uh, make a change close to round one. Yeah. And probably the final rookie question we'll probably end off with here as we wrap up uh, sort of the question part of the podcast and that. Uh, so Paul Rogers and Brisbane Bloods have a pretty similar sort of question. So they're saying, how many rookies do you guys currently have on field? And Paul was saying to include Hall and Finlay McRae as rookies. So what I'll put quickly do is I'll probably go through each line and sort of ask both of you. So I'll go through defenders. So um, Tim, we'll go to you first. How many defender rookies do you currently have on field? Um, well, if we're calling rookie players 300k, none. None, okay. Try. I got Marty Hoare sitting at D6 and then Curtin on my bench. Uh, yeah, in a perfect world, Hoare plays, like I've said at the early part of the podcast. But if not, then I, I think I'll just be trusting Dan Curtin at D6. Yep. I love the rest of my structure. Um, so, yeah, that's how I'm tracking. Yeah, I've currently got Hoare as well, then Dan Curtin at D7. Uh, so field. Yeah, midfield, I think we said before that I've got three, Tim. I think you said two and Fry, you've got yeah. three as well. Is that correct, boys? Yeah. Yep, yes. Yeah, sweet. And then the forward line. So I, if we're counting Finn McRae rookie, I've currently got him and Harley Reid on field. So Fry, how many rookies in the forward line you got? Yeah, I'm the same. I have uh, chopped and changed whether I'm going to pick Elijah Sardis or not. Um, and Caleb Windsor, some of those other types have made their way under my field at times. But I think I'll be going with throwing darts at more of your mid-priced value picks in the forward line. Uh, God knows what's going on in the forwards this year, but <laughs> I think, um, yeah, Reid and Finn McRae are the two that I trust at the moment with Windsor on the bench. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully a couple of other cheaper blokes bob up as bench picks. Yeah, Tim, how many forward rookies? Yeah, I'm the same as you guys with McRae and Reid, but I am going to try and squeeze one more rookie onto the field there. Mm. Yeah, could be, could be if we need some more cash. Um, with Heath Chapman, especially for me going down, I'll probably need a bit more cash to try and upgrade him because I'm not sure if I want to go Williams, Caulfield, Hoare and Elliot Yo uh, on my field. So I think that's a bit risky for my part. So I think maybe I'll try and uh, fit um, 
a an uh, so upgrade instead of downgrading. But um, final three ones that we'll do. I'll do rapid fire just because these aren't rookies. But um, appreciate that. So the questions being sort of um, flown in. So we will answer them quickly. So I'll go to so one for each of us. So Fryer, the first one I'll go for you being the Freo man. He said Jordan Clark at D five or Z will at D six. Is is that spending too much in defence? Nah, not at all. We talked about there's a lot of rookies in the midfield. There's ones I love in the forward line. There's nothing in the rucks and it's very bare in the back line. So I currently have someone like Brady Hoff as my D5. And I think paying up in the back line, uh, regardless of kind of who you're targeting to a certain extent, I think is actually a smart tactic. Yep. Yeah, definitely could be that case. Uh, Tim, obviously you've been the West Coast man. I'll go for you for this one. Uh, thoughts on Elliot Yo? That one is coming from, if I get the name, just disappeared on me from the chat. Uh, so Ben Hayes was saying he's got Yo at D3. So what are your thoughts with him? Locked and loaded, baby. He might even go to D2 for me. Oh, jeez. Bloody hell. <laughs> nah, look, I mean, look, obviously huge concerns with the injury, right? And, uh, you know, anything could snap or pop or tear or, you know, at any minute. But if he gets through to the preseason unscathed, then, I mean, he's going to have that high midfield role. Um, and we know that he is a, a player that can score in the realm of that top six. So um, being that he's priced at uh, what is he priced at six hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars. So what are we talking? It's a break-even of uh, seventy. No, yeah, seventy. Flat. Seventy. So yeah. Look, I mean, there's you know there, there's potentially twenty twenty-five points there. You'd you'd be you know you'd be crazy not to have him in your team. I mean, obviously there's those concerns about um, injury, but this year um, you know we've got those eighteen. Best 18 in some of those early rounds. So once again, you know, if he does uh, pop something after, you know, a 14 or a 12 or a 6 or whatever it is, then uh, it's just not going to count. So um, I think there's more reason to play it this year than any other. Yeah, unless it's obviously round one or four. But I know MJ, uh, Coach Penn, always likes to say that it's actually better to start with an injury play yeah, player than trade. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and I agree with that. It's only one so, trade, yeah. Only one yeah, trade exactly. Final question here as well was from Uncle Deja. And it's, and it's actually funny. We got one question about a Freer player for Fry, one question about an Eagles player for Tim, and then a question about a Crows player for me. Uh, Uncle Deja said, Mitch Hinge, thoughts. Um, I think that's going to be – I wouldn't. I don't think I'd be starting him in classy. I think dra- bump him up your draft order because I think if Crows look to play two key defenders, if it's a Mark Keane, if Jordan Butts is there, James Borlase, so they've got a couple of guys there, obviously Nick Murray, hopefully not too far away from a Crow standpoint. Um, I think Hinge will be able to be maybe freed up a little bit more instead of playing a bit tall, but there might be weeks as well where they can't up against a taller forward line. He might have to play tall. So I wouldn't start him, but a draft one uh, for sure. And if we see something in the preseason, then you could maybe consider it as a bit of a unique play as well. And then Blaze just put one here. Thoughts on Elijah Sard. I think he's just one you're watching the preseason, I think. Um, just Blaze there and see how he goes. Uh, and then also just a shout out to um, so Simon just gave us a follow. We've just hit 2,000 followers on uh, t- uh, Twitter or X. So well thanks done, everyone boys. for the support uh, there you guys have shown. Obviously legends have got around uh, me and Tim, which is fantastic. And we uh, love and appreciate every single one of you. But I think, Tim, that's uh, the questions and everything like that. Did you want to give us a bit of a um, bit of a taste of the uh, Content Creators Cup? What's going out this year? Yeah, yeah. Look, um, uh, look, there's been a couple of changes. Uh, things are primarily the same, but there's a couple of changes this year just in terms of some of the content creators that will be uh, uh, participating. Um, but, look, stay tuned for details. Just like last year, obviously, Infinite Wealth kind of got behind it. We did some, you know, juicy uh, kind of gifts for the, the fantasy coaches out there. So I'm kind of I'm trying to put some put put my brain to work at the moment. Come up with something for fantasy coaches for this year, but I haven't worked that out yet. So uh, give me a couple of weeks to sort that out. But um, yeah, we'll get the content creators cup uh, launched and announced in terms of who will be participating and what the prizes will be this year. Very very soon. But apart from that, let's turn it over and say thank you very much to Fry for coming on. Or is there something you want to say, Zebar? Oh no, I was just going to say the one. Do uh, you want to? Obviously, people would have maybe seen the tweet. But there's a certain aim that you have for the content crowds cut this year. Your personal <laughs> oh. vendetta, personal goal. <laughs> you got your eyes set. Well, let's not make too. I, I was. It was. A, it's a little bit of a joke, mate. But why not? Mm. Love. Love a little bit of uh, banter on Twitter. So I've been stirring up Mitch fucking Casey over there at the Ball Boys uh, <laughs> after he beat me last year. So I, I want to get my own back. I love a bit of competition. I never forget. Never forget. There's a story about Shane Warne told uh, tells about Alan Border, and uh, he basically said something along the lines of like, if you ever feel off, or you feel like you're not at the top of your game. He says, pick a fight. 
because it'll kind of, you know, getting into that fight or flight mode or picking a fight will get you on, you know, kind of in your top performance. So uh, that's a bit of a strategy for me this year. I'm going to pick a fight with Mitch Casey and see if I can <laughs> uh, see if I can outperform him. But, uh, yeah, more to details to come about the Content Creators Cup. But, mate, Fry, firstly, thanks a lot for coming on, mate, Detail uh, and all the players that you covered off with us are, you know, really helpful for coaches and we love Obviously, you're always jumping in and helping us out and doing round reviews and rookie reports and all that kind of stuff. But, mate, uh, how can uh, our listeners support you? Mate? Where can they follow you? Where can they get behind you? Yeah, thanks for having me as always, boys. I love uh, popping onto the Twitter spaces and our fantasy community. Uh, you can track me down just by searching Sports by Fry, all of your popular social medias. There's rumours uh, that a cheap Patreon might be uh, popping up before the AFL fantasy season starts with a Ooh. bit more in-depth rookie analysis than uh, what I provide to the general public. So, um, yeah, I'll talk more about that in later date. But, um, yeah, as I said, thanks for having me. Love uh, popping on with the lads. And, um, yeah, good luck for the season. Awesome. Well, let me also say a big thanks to those who joined us on our Twitter live space. Uh, keep in mind, obviously, throughout the season, we'll be doing the live spaces. Uh, we'll be doing the, the pre-lockout chats on a Friday afternoon. We'll be doing the round reviews on a Sunday night. Although there might be some changes to that because there's some changes to the fixture this year with some uh, Monday night or Sunday night games and stuff like that. But look, of course, we'll let everyone know. Now, of course, if you've got more questions, um, and thanks for those that sent them in, but if you've got more questions, send us through to us on Twitter and please give us a follow at AFL Fantasy Fans. Um, don't forget to tune in each week and remember that you can listen to these spaces on the AFL Fantasy Fanatics podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, please subscribe to the pod. Please give us a five-star rating. And if you're on Apple, give us a review as well. Best of luck with your research and trades. And, guys, we will catch you again possibly at the same time next week. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. See ya. Peace.